everybody. Uh, hope you're all having a great holiday. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, Redshift render settings. And we're going to go through in a deep dive all these render settings and what they do. It can be quite challenging at first because there's so many of them. But in reality, it's not that difficult. And once you get what they do, it's really quite easy to understand how Redshift's basic global illumination settings and other settings actually work. So I'm going to start off by looking at the render settings. And there's two basic modes. There's a basic and an advanced mode. If I click on this Redshift tab here under the render. So if I go to basic, it just shows me maybe like eight things that I can manipulate or toggle on and off. Um, but it's almost easier to understand the basic settings if you look at the advanced settings a little bit first. So we're just going to start with sampling. So the first two things we're going to see with sampling is the interactive rendering and the final rendering. The interactive rendering is when you uh, open up the render view and then you click on interactive rendering and it gives you a really quick render of what you're looking at. So most of the time interactive rendering is set to progressive so that we can see our result quite quickly. And then the final rendering is always set to bucket. So what the bucket is are these little squares that render out the image. So usually if I click render, I see a bunch of little squares in a swirl kind of pattern trying to slowly output this image. So usually I just leave it on bucket and keep it at default because that's usually what renders out a higher quality image for the final rather than interactive rendering. And the next thing we're going to look at is unified sampling. Now in order to understand unified sampling, we have to understand what global illumination does. What global illumination does is it sends out these rays called primary rays and they hit an object in a straight line. And the first hit that hits the object is called a direct bounce. But then bouncing off that object, the rays also hit another object to another object, and we call that indirect bounces. So with these bounces, uh, there's an area of effect. So sending out multiple rays, the area of effect varies, and that makes it so that there's noise. There's greater area of effects, and there's lesser area of effects that cause the noise. So unified sampling is a way to clean up that noise and make the image clearer. It's an adaptive sampling technology which detects parts of the image and then automatically adjust the number of primary rays for each pixel. So you can toggle the sampling to either have high quality or faster speed. So if I look at this value here that says threshold, uh, it's usually set to 0 0.01, which is uh, very low, meaning that it's going to have a higher sensitivity when it detects noise and then corrects it. But I could also change that to something like 1, and that gives it a lower sensitivity so that it does not detect noise at such a minute amount. But by default, it is set to 0 0.01. So that brings us on to our next topic, which is denoising. So denoising is a technique that removes noise from the image and can be fast or can take a long time depending on how you change these settings. But ultimately, adding denoising does not increase render times that greatly compared to rendering out a scene without it at a higher threshold. So Redshift supports three denoisers. Uh, we have, if I click Enable, we have Optics. We have Atlas Single, which is uh, pretty much the same denoiser as Atlas Dual. And then we have Open Image Denoise. Uh, most of the times we're going to stick to Optics, so that is probably the better one. But they each have their pros and cons. So Atlas is the best because of its compatibility. The algorithms are more predictable and they are compatible for all hardware. And Optics is very fast and we can do this with interactive rendering. Uh, but this is probably only available for NVIDIA hardware. And with Odin, sometimes it has a trouble detecting noise because it has been trained in a particular case. So you have to train Odin in order to detect noise by rendering out multiple scenes. So that's it for about this page. Um, so let's recap. It's basically noise and then denoising on the samplings page. So next we're going to go to motion blur. And motion blur is a technique to simulate real life cameras when objects are moving quickly and cause a blurring effect. 
So redshift supports three types of motion blurs. There is a camera motion blur, which happens because something is blurring because of the camera movement. There is a transformation motion blur, which happens because of movement of some sort of object. And then there's deformation motion blur, which occurs when vertexes are being moved due to morphing or skinning. So basically clicking this button here enables the motion blur. And then we have steps which control the accuracy of the motion blur. So usually you don't need too many. I usually set this to three. And then I usually turn on deformation blur if I'm dealing with vertex level or point level animation. And then here we have the presets for types of shutters. So if we have a still, it's from a still image that is akin to still image camera. And then we have movie, which can be closer to a 35 millimeter and then custom, which allows you to set your own shutter speeds. So these presets are pretty good by themselves. And I would just leave the default presets for most of these because they usually work in most situations. So next up, we're going to move on to globals. So what globals does, it's a little bit like the samplings tab. Uh, it also has to deal with rays. So here we can set our ray engine to production or RT. And also this is really useful, uh, hardware ray tracing if available. So if your card supports ray tracing, it allows it to have better accuracy. And then here we can define the trace steps, which specifies the maximum number of rays that you would want. So here we have combined, which is all of these values, reflection, refraction, volume, transparency, all combined. And it's set to six, so it's telling me that I set six rays coming from the global illumination uh, affecting the scene combined. So we usually just select this combined, and that is the maximum limit. So even if you set these higher for reflection, refraction, volume, and transparency, it's still going to be capped at this combined value. Then we have reflection for is the cap on how many times a reflection ray can bounce. Then we have refraction for how many times a refraction ray can bounce, and then so on and so forth. So this is about it for the section that has to do with rays and global illumination. All these other ones, uh, they have to do with things like hair and color management globally. And then we have overrides and then other options such as default light. So basically hair is uh, a setting here that allows for anti-aliasing of the hair to be a little bit more finite and adjustable. Management of the color space of your image. So when you render out from Redshift, uh, the image seems a little bit different from other render engines because the image is going through this color management tab. And what it does is it puts it into ACES color space, which is a color management created by the Academy of Motion Picture and Art and Sciences, which allows for better color accuracy. And it also tones down the exposure for most of your shots. So it equalizes the levels so that nothing is too exposed or too bright. But we can always change this to some other color space that we can define. But right now, all you have to know is that if you change this, your image is going to look different in terms of color. And you can always go here and go to Untone Map to give you an image that is closer to what it would look like in another software such as Maya or Blender. And then under Options, we have options such as the default light. So when you render out a scene without lights, uh, it's going to keep this default light on so that it shows the object under some sort of lighting condition. Finally, here we have other overrides, which say that you can turn off the reflection, the refraction, the subsurface scattering emission, and other things such as tessellation and displacement. So if I select one of these and I turn it off, my whole scene is not going to have any reflections. And moving on to global illumination. So global illumination is how Redshift calculates light. And that goes back to light hitting an object and then bouncing to another object and then bouncing to another object, causing both direct and indirect rays. So here we can enable it or change the GI engine. Uh, this is usually set to brute force by default, and that is usually the most powerful one. 
And also here we can define trace depths for the global illumination rays, which are how many times that the direct ray will bounce. And then the secondary engine is kind of like a backup to the first ray, which tells it how many times the indirect ray will bounce after the first. So there's various pros and cons to using brute force and a radiance cache. So if you use brute force, your pros are that is the most accurate, but it's also the slowest. And with the radiance cache, you can have a cleaner image, but sometimes uh, the animation can flicker if you render out multiple images. And then here you have some settings for this irradiance point cloud to help it to render quicker. So things such as load will help you to generate an irradiance point cloud once, so that points in the scene that records the information for lighting, and then it will save it in the cache for Cinema 4D. And then every single time you render out a new scene, it'll base data from the previous render and load it to decrease render times. So here is the file that it saves the irradiance point cloud to, and it saves that data so you can load it. And this can also help with things such as flickering in animations, so that if you save it, it keeps a record of things and stabilizes things a bit more. And then the rest are just settings for this irradiance point cloud cache. So next we have caustics. And here is kind of like the irradiance point cache too. You can also save a file that holds caustics data to your computer and then load it every single time you render again. So it's very handy to save on render times a little bit too. But to go back on caustics a little bit, it's a way that light behaves when it travels through things such as glass. And it's kind of like a distortion of the light. But it's also the caustics, or the surface, bending the light a certain way to reflect onto another material as an indirect bounce. So here we can specify the caustic rays, uh, trace depths, which is the amount of rays that are sent through the caustics calculation. Okay, so moving on, we have AOV, which are settings for the render passes. So AOVs are render passes. They stand for arbitrary output variables. And here we can specify the AOV rendering mode. So if we enable it, it renders AOVs for batch rendering and non-batch rendering. And if it says batch only, it only enables AOVs for batch rendering. And then disable does not enable AOVs at all. And here we have the file name for rendering output files. So here we have dollar sign project and then the AOV, which is the render pass name. So such as ambient occlusion or reflection, uh, etc. And then the rest is all just different specifications for the file of the AOV. And then the rest we have just more settings for AOVs such as clamping, and adjusting raw AOVs for halo artifacts, which is to ensure a composite between two BD passes will match. So these settings I would just leave the default. Uh, there's nothing to worry about these. Uh, just in specific situations where you might encounter an issue, these can help to troubleshoot that issue a little bit more. So I'm just going to move on to optimizations. These also alter how Redshift behaves in certain situations, so we could specify the subsurface scatterings rendering mode, uh, such as ray traced or point based. And we could also record that scatter here uh, under load. We could save that scatter as a scattering map and also increase the number of GI rays in that scatter. So, uh, cutoff threshold. So, like if you think about the ray bouncing from the primary to the secondary uh, you can see the ray being changed in color and getting dimmer and so the cutoff threshold specifies when that ray becomes completely obliterated by going through levels of indirect bouncing and then russian roulette is basically an optimization calculation for the rays that shoot from different objects such as glass and can also help to speed up render times by just a little bit. I would leave this alone. It's not too important to worry about. And then finally, we have ray traced acceleration, which deals with optimization of the ray tracing, uh, which also can be left alone. And it's just minor increases in render time. And finally, we have the system. 
and these have a lot of little settings that affect how things behave inside of the system of Redshift, so such as inside of the logging and feedback. There's verbosity, which tells you how often warnings will occur, and also diagnostic messages that might tell you if your scene has problematic things and can be shared with the Redshift development team. So bucket rendering is what we talked before and those little squares that render out and you can specify their size and if they move in a spiral or horizontally or this other pattern that is kind of like a zigzag pattern. And then shader baking, you can bake your shader into your textures, uh, which is kind of important at times to save on rendering times. And then we have units here uh, that can tell what your scene is measured in. So you could specify meters or kilometers or millimeters here, which is useful for architectural renderings and computer assisted design. And then we have some legacy features here, which we have a lot. Uh, they are just useful for specific debugging situations. But I think the most useful here is reflection effects alpha channel which tells Redshift to add an alpha channel behind the pane of glass so that you can composite something behind that glass object. And then the rest here are just not that important to worry about. Um, experimental is just some things that can help you debug and also debugging capture, which records your debugging and then certain memory settings that help out with GPU memory allocation for your hardware. So now that we know all about Redshift advanced settings, if we go back to these basic settings, uh, they're just condensed versions of the advanced settings. So bucket quality, we learned about that, denoising, motion blur, global illumination, and trace depths. We learned about all of those while looking at the advanced settings. So it's just shortened down and easily accessible settings that you can change on the fly. And this bucket quality, if you change these, it just gives you another preset of how refined your bucket is. And here it shows what was changed in the advanced settings. And that's it. I hope that was helpful and you learned a little bit of something for your next Redshift rendering. And I'll see you next time.